Romance at a glance. Uh huh. Romance at a glance. What you say? Romance at a glance. Go ahead, girl. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Romance at a Glance. I am your host, Bridget, and today we are doing an Authors at a Glance with Sonali Dev. She's the author of such romantic books as Pride and Prejudice and Other Flavors, A Bollywood Affair and Series, and most recently, Recipe for Persuasion, which we are reviewing on Friday. Or if this is a future, we've already reviewed it. Hello, future people. It's nice to see you. We had so much fun interviewing Sonali. Shawnee got to fangirl hardcore over all their favorite Bollywood movies. We talked about romance novels, well, duh, uh, which characters in her own romance novels she identifies with, sex scenes. I mean, we just had so much fun. She is vivacious and funny. She's fascinating and just filled with so much passion for writing, so much passion for the genre. I am 100% positive that you are going to enjoy this wonderful chat with author Sonali Dev. Also, guys, she's low-key a smoke show, so just putting that out there. Let's get it poppin'. Hi, Sonali. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Bridget. This is my co-host, Shawnee. Hey, I'm so excited you're here. I'm Uh, so excited to be here. (laughs) We are so glad that we found your books. Yes. Okay. So I grew up like immersed in Indian culture. My uh, my aunt and uncle actually uh, studied different cultures. And so I went in and spent the summer with them. Everything we did was around Indian culture and Bollywood. So I have watched hundreds, if not thousands of Bollywood movies (laughs) at this point. Uh, And so I'm very excited to experience uh, your books because um, it's like, the romance, like to, to feel the culture in book form is just exciting to me. I'm like, oh my gosh, we found, we found her. I'm so excited. <laughs> That's so great. Yeah, there should be more. <laughs> There's more, you know, authors now writing in that space. But that's very exciting. And and thousands, I might not have watched thousands <laughs> of Hollywood movies myself. So that's true. <laughs> I might have. I don't know. We'll, we'll have to compare notes later. I'm, a, I'm an obsessive person, though. I only do things to the extreme. <laughs> That's so fabulous. I Yeah, I think, you know, I'm not going to admit to that, but mm, yeah. <laughs> I was uh, really excited that she was a soccer player because I watched Bend It Like Beckham in high school. It came out my junior, sophomore year while I was in soccer season. Me and all of my team went maybe 10 times to the theater. Like still one of my top 10 favorite movies of all time. Yeah. So as soon as she played soccer, I was like, oh, it's Bend It. It's grown up Bend It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think well, I think definitely Gurinder Chadda's best film. I used to think Bhaji on the Beach was, but but I think Bandit like Beckham is her swan song. I it mean, really it's is. Such a gorgeous, gorgeous film. I love yeah, it. <laughs> I do too. The music, the the pacing, like it's so good. One thing uh we are really excited about as we were reading your book is your book's pacing is so good. We've been reading a lot of books now as we've been reviewing and we found that like some people are at the beginning are like really telling us a lot, but not like bringing us along for the journey. Um, How do you break down that pacing and, and kind of have the characters showing us and doing it for us versus like you telling us? So so I think that's two different questions, right? One is, one is the, pacing and and the other is show versus tell and and I think um I I do and most of my writing happens in revisions so I am I mean talk about being an obsessive person I think I mean a hundred revisions is probably standard this is why it takes me you know a year on you know once I get my hands on a first draft, it takes me a year because um, because it, it's this flat word vomit the first time it comes out. But um, so so all of the so so I do a lot of tightening and a lot of layering and a lot of that in revision over and over and over again until I can't see straight. So some of it I think is that um, so you know taking out every. Um, extra word put, putting in words taking them out again putting them in like this kind of mad process which makes no sense and is really not healthy <laughs> but that's my process I do think that one of the things that a lot of my writer friends talk about that 
that I don't struggle with is the sagging middle. And I think that is because, um, because the stakes are always so high. So they're high stake books. And someday I want to write like just, you know, a, a book with lower stakes because it's exhausting how how high stakes, you know, emotionally um, and external, but emotionally the stakes are very high. Um, I'm, I'm writing the third book in the series right now and he's running for governor. And, you know, of course, that whole thing with, you know, a whole kind of whole culture, a whole community, a whole family who's been dreaming of this thing is something he carries on his back. And of course, that's what he will destroy if a certain thing happens. And so so the stakes are exhaustingly high. I, I feel sometimes like too much. And so by the time I kind of, you know, build those stakes and then start to come down from the story, there's no place for this breathing in a story. And sometimes I actually, when I'm reading some authors that I love, I do love that phase when they're, you know, when the couple is together and they're having, you know, mm -hmm. this, you know, they have a relationship and you get to see the relationship. And sometimes, especially since these are Austin inspired, structurally, the story ends when they get together. Right. And so you don't get to have a relationship with them. And, and, and you know, it is something I miss, but it helps with the pacing in terms of, you know, when you're reading books that have more of that structure, which is, you know, the, the actual romance structure, contemporary romance structure, where you get to see them having a relationship. And in those books, you're like, okay, now when is something going to go wrong? Because you know something is going to go wrong. I know. I hate that feeling where you're like, oh, no, who's going to fuck it all up today? <laughs> and yet you love it, right? Because you're like, oh, they're so it. happy. I'm so happy with them. And and you don't, at least in the, in these Rajay books, you don't get to see that because you don't get to be in a relationship with them. And so that that's something I kind of, you know, miss, but it's an advantage in terms of pacing because you're like, you know, what next, what next, what next? And um, and, and so the, the stakes keep rising and then boom, and then you're fixing whatever is happening. But it is a very, um, you know, I mean, at, at every point, I'm, I'm continuously... Uh, re-examining what that scene is saying, what you know, where they are at, because I think my entire process is basically just arcs, character arcs and story arcs. So where they started off, what they're trying to fix, where they started off, what they're trying to fix, where they need to be to let happiness into their life, and um, and and so I stay very true to that arc, and and that takes a while. <laughs> Because the first few, um, the first few versions um, are only like that inside my head, but not on on paper. How did you come up with the idea of of sort of basing the plots on the Pride and Prejudice and Jane Austen novels? Th that was, you know, when we have these big dreams that are just like dreams, and you don't really think, and and being 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 a published author is is that too like when you're a little girl and for me you know there's authors who say you know well I didn't ever even think about being an author and it's literally something that I have dreamt about being for as long as I could remember even before I could talk to people about it or anything if you had ever asked me what was the one thing you wanted to be um even when I completely did not believe there was a chance in hell that that was going to happen, it was being, you know, having my book on shelves and, you know, just being this. And I always like perceived myself as this, you know, long straight hair, you know, great bone structure, lots of eye makeup, <laughs> kind of, you know, the, the activist uh, author who had very intelligent things to say about everything. So, so it was always a dream, and I think, a, you know. A part of that dream, so very early on, so of course I would dream of things that I would be writing about and, you know, shows I'd be on and awards I'd be winning and speeches I'd be giving in front of mirrors and things like that. And one of those dreams was um, was doing these Jane Austen retellings. And I always thought it would be, you know, like I remember the first time that idea came to me, oh, you know what? I want to do all four books and I want to do them under one story umbrella. Like, isn't, wouldn't that be brilliant? And of course, I never really believed that I would actually do it. But once I had published my first book, so I wrote down um, the concepts for these four books in December of 2013 before Bollywood Affair came out. 
So once I had sold and once I knew, once I was having conversations with my then agent about, you know, what next, this was what I, the first thing I said to her. And she said, uh, well, you know, Austin is so, Austin doesn't sell anymore. What a lie. What a lie. (laughs) She's not, they make a new movie about Jane Austen. They just made a new adaptation on Hulu like this year. Uh, and exactly, and there were three, uh, the year that um, Pride, Prejudice and Other Flavors came out, which was last year, 2019, there were three South Asian retellings, you know, in one year, in, in six months, actually. And all three of them were completely different books, fabulous books, and, um, and you know, and, and sold well. So it's, you know, it was completely, and, and fortunately for me, I'm stubborn enough where when she said, oh, you know, this was my first, and it's also really lucky to be a published author later in life. Well, of course, it's also lucky if you're 20 and you sell. I did not have that experience, but, but being the, you know, being an older person, when somebody tells you, oh, that doesn't sell, what's next? You're like, oh, no, excuse me. There's nothing next. This is what I'm going to do. and um you know, and, and we'll sell it, you know, if, if something else doesn't sell, that's their problem. (laughs) And so it did not even for a second dissuade me that, you know, and I, so I always knew I was going to do it. So that was the grand plan was to write these four, which is pride, uh, pride and prejudice, persuasion, sense and sensibility and Emma as four standalone novels. Um, under one story umbrella and that story umbrella is this gubernatorial race um, that the oldest son in this family is running and so the the books kick kick off when he announces and the books will end you know when the election results um, come out and so that was kind of my grand plan um, which way back like in I was thinking about it for years before that but 2013 is when I wrote it down and the other thing I knew for sure was that they were not going to be scene by scene retellings, but they were going to be these complete um, standalone stories that were mine completely. And uh, that I just got to explore the things I learned from her books. So when I say homage uh, to Jane Austen, it literally is personally things that I picked up on reading as a very young person her books. And, you know, and, and and examining how that sits or what I learned as a person, because a lot of who I am as a person is based on the books I read as a child, as we all are. And and this is more an examination of those things than it really is. Oh, where's the proposal scene? Although there is a proposal scene in Pride, Prejudice and Other Flavors. But but you'll be and, you know, you've read the books the hard pressed to even find um you know, I feel like the them- thematics are there, but there's no, uh, you know, there's really, it's not a scene by scene retelling. So you, you just mentioned that you uh, knew what you wanted to do. You knew that you had these four books and we're very curious um, how we like to ask authors, how much did you have mapped out before you started book one? Like how did you know exactly like what was going to happen in each book before you even started? Or did you, it was a kind of a loose concept. Like how did you figure out what that looked like? So I am, um, I'm, I'm an outliner. And as I said, I'm a story arc outliner. So I kind of, you know, I knew the characters in all four books because I knew this family. That's kind of where this started from, that there is this family. It starts for me from like three generations, right? So from great grandfather, when there's like, you know, their, their great grandfather, the Maharaja who, you know, um, who built underground, this whole underground system during the freedom struggle, where he hid the rebels. And like, it starts from that, because that's what comes down through, you know, through what they've been taught. And even though they're royals, and there's some indolence there, a lot of it is this, you know, warriors and, you know, revolutionaries against the British and things like that. So it starts for me from there. And then these three sons and how they are completely different than their kids and how they are, you know, so it kind of comes down from there. And and so the character is where it comes from. And so I knew the general stories or or at least what is wrong with each one of these protagonists and and of course, you know, I mean, it changes as you dig through a story and you find out more. Um, but but little things change. Like 
you know, I wasn't 100% sure Rico was going to be playing, you know, football, uh, soccer. I he uh, When I first thought about it, you know, I was thinking sports person. And so he was probably going to be a football, you know, an NFL football player. And, and then I realized that, you know, there were so many reasons why I did not want to do no, that. No, football so, players are so much better. I was all about the <laughs> Premier League. When I was in South America, I had two separate people with that exact name who were, I used to call them my unicorn. Cause it was like, I was traveling. So it was like near misses, you know, it's like, we'd like have this great dinner with all these people, but then one of us would leave. And so I appreciated the name. I love the world cup. I love the premier league. I was all over yes, it. So I Good do, choice. So, Nobody <laughs> wants, I mean, the NFL, come on. No, exactly. No. <laughs> and there were story reasons. There were story reasons. I mean, I have a huge number of issues. So I'm not um, growing I grew up in a house where my brother's um, room was, you know, floor to ceiling soccer players. We we literally had like, um, I think, a 14 foot tall Maradona poster. I'm dating myself, but, <laughs> but you know, so a companion of my childhood was Maradona's thighs. And so, <laughs> you know, so, so there was... Um, so yes, we grew up. I grew up much more in a cricket and sock. You know, we called it football, so the cr- cricket and football culture. Um, having said that, I have since kind of, you know, grown away from the uh, the team sports and the kind of you know making athletes gods thing. And then with the whole NFL thing and you know the Copernic thing that happened, and you know, so I have so many reasons why I would not touch NFL with them. Uh, Mm-hmm. you know with a large pole but um but my son and, and of course I don't understand it at all like it's like what is going on like why why does everyone have a different role it's a game you should have a goal you have a ball you put the ball in the goal like what is all this flags and guards yeah. and, and my son played I think through elementary school and middle school because Naperville is such a football town and because my little you know South Asian boy wanted to be uh, an all-american jock and not a south asian nerd <laughs> and so he had to do his journey so you know uh, the first time he went to practice i put his pads he was in third grade i think and or fourth grade and i put his pads on all wrong in those pants and the coach was like oh gosh I was going to have to start here. <laughs> I was like, yes, we're going to have to start here. And every one of his games, I was like, what are they doing again? What? Where? Where are they going? And my husband was like, can you just, just pretend you're getting it? <laughs> so I started pretending. So so I was not going to do NFL really, but originally kind of, you know, you, you think this is set in America. And of course, the other story reason is that they had to geographically be separated for 12 years and so it could have been that she's in San Francisco and he's in Chicago but I didn't want that kind of, you know it still stays in the news right. and in the so I wanted him clean gone for you know um mm-hmm. for, for 12 years and so soccer of course worked out really well what is the character because you have so many great, like distinct voices in the books. Which character is the one that really that you're like rooting for that you connect with? A hard, hard question. Because of course, it's like asking me which of my children is my favorite. Uh-huh. And and my kids try this all the time, and I don't have a favorite. <laughs> They're like, mom, that can't be true. It's absolutely true. So uh, so I think it's a little bit like that. But I will say that in terms of, you know, personally, in terms of what I really connect with or, or someone who's been a character that has really given voice to so much that I needed voice given to is Shobi. And, uh, you know, so so I think Shobi is, is the vessel for all my feminine anger you know and and so being able to write her was such a gift was such a gift like uh, I did not have to hold myself back um and it's it kind of is all out there you know and she she gave me and I love her because she gave me the chance to do that all the things I believe about women and 
Indian culture, but women across cultures, everything I believe, um, you know, about um, about what happens to women who fight, um, what should happen, and the fact that this is a person who proves everyone right in some ways, and then proves everyone wrong by making her way out of that hell that they tell us will befall us if we're not everything to everyone, if we don't sacrifice, if we don't do the right thing all the time. And, and she is the person who, with whom I got to play with this idea that what happens if we say, no, I'm putting myself first, right? What happens when we say that? Yes, they will be right. And yes, we will lose things. And yes, we will hurt our children sometimes. And, you know, and, and yes, we'll have really dark times. But I wanted to dig out of that hole and say, but yes, we'll also find our full power and everything will be okay again. And we will make our way back to our children and love and all of that. And so I think just Shobi, in this moment at this time, I was old enough and a mature enough writer to write her whilst addressing so many of my personal issues. So I think I, I think as a personal, um, you know, victory or as a personal healing, she, I think Shobi is that character for me. How, I mean, I know Indian culture does have a lot of, like you said, like a lot of expectations on women and their role. How did your family and friends respond to your decision to become a, a writer in general and also a romance writer? You know, I get asked that all the time. So there are expectations. It's it's just, you know, I think in Pride Prejudice and other flavors, there's a line where the, the two kids are discussing their parents and they say that unconditional love is an oxymoron to our parents. <laughs> and that is very true. Um, you know, I mean, if you love someone, how can you not have conditions? How can you not push them to be their best? You know, I mean, that's just how um, at least, and of course it's not a monolith. People have all sorts of various, um, you know, experiences and relationships with their own culture, but that's mine is, um, you, you know, our families, our family doesn't practice a whole lot of boundaries. <laughs> it's it's generally a pretty uh, foreign term. <laughs> I mean, wait, wait. There's there's families that practice boundaries. <laughs> yeah, I don't know them. Mine does not. Um, I don't. You know, my son just turned twenty one. And this was the first time that, um, um, you know, this was his first birthday that I was not with him. And of course, this was the greatest tragedy ever to befall me. And my daughter had to hold my hand and say, mom, he's a 21 year old man. Spending his birthday with his mom is <laughs> not, you know, at the top of his list. And he was very sweet and very patient with me. And he was like, I'll come home, then we'll celebrate. It's okay. <laughs> So, you know, that's, um, and my mom is that multiplied by a hundred. Like she would be, you don't want to spend your time <laughs> with me. And so it would be a whole different. So, so you know, we are what our kids call extra. <laughs> but, but, but so, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's very much, um, it, it that like boundaries or um you know so, so boundaries expectations these are just like words that that we don't process <laughs> sometimes i think and and so um so so that line in pride prejudice and other flavors is very much like you know it, what you know what is unconditional love like we're starting from that that's our baseline <laughs> So, so, I, and your question, of course, I have forgotten. What <laughs> was? Um, it's just, it's just, how did everyone respond to you sort yeah, of declaring okay. you're a writer and a romance writer? All right. So, um, so, so, having said all of that, I think that the basis of that is love, right? I mean, everybody, in, I can say with complete, um, uh, you know, absolute confidence that everyone in my family wants me to be happy. And and even though I push my children and, and don't give them space sometimes and all of that, really the only thing I'm interested in in is them being happy. And and uh and so um 
So I don't think I have had anything but pride and support from anyone. You know, I mean, I'll um, it, everybody makes you know will will use it as fodder for humor, of course. You know, um, with a lot of the the sex jokes and the research jokes and all of that. But I think everyone is incredibly proud. I also don't think. I mean, they think of um, me as someone who writes about love. So I don't think they think about. And this might just be a little bit of ignorance being bliss. I don't think that the whole, um, you know, weight that some um, some romance authors carry in terms of I hate the words to use the word stigma, but that's the reason you asked the question is that you know there are families who might think that there is a stigma to this. I don't think my family is aware that there is a stigma about writing about love, you know. So um, so there is um, so there is that, and it's very fortunate. <laughs> I'm very grateful for it. There are, you know, there are things like uh, my, including my children, they were very, very, very happy when my first cover came out and there was no man chest on it because they <laughs> were mosquitoes. And I think, you know, they were like, oh, you know, is it going to be like the books mom reads? And then, you know, so I think they were a little worried. So when they saw the hands on Bollywood Affair, they were very happy that there was no, there was no naked man on my cover. And I was very sad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not. But, but so that, and, you know, they've had, um, they've had, my son was a freshman when Bollywood, um, in high school, when Bollywood Bride came out and his friend group, uh, his, his, uh, the girls in his friend group read uh, the sex scene out loud in the cafeteria. So, so he he was, you know, I think he's traumatized for life. The yeah. poor child will never read a book that I write. <laughs> he reads all, you know, all the blog posts and all of that, but he will not. Like, I think, I mean, you know, that's so so stuff like that happens. But even with that, it's funny. It's not, you know, nobody, uh, nobody thinks about this. Um, and if they do, they're doing it in a very, um, you know, they're doing it in a place where I cannot see it from where I'm standing. All I see is, you know, is support and pride. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, so sometimes impatience with the world for it, you know, that I'm not Jumbalari yet or, you know, <laughs> that I'm not selling as much as Nora Roberts. So they they, they might even be. Uh, angry on my behalf <laughs> sometimes but but it's um yeah no it's it's there not a moment ever of um anything but pride that's awesome that's, um, that's awesome. i feel so bad for your son like know, that's so that's just rude like those I girls know. those girls should have been like all excited like hey <laughs> they, they were doing it to traumatize him and he was traumatized sure. and you know, sure. I have to say that if I was them I might have pulled something like that myself so I can't judge them but yeah, teenage girls can be <laughs> vicious <laughs> oh my god so so when I was a kid I told Bridget this already but like um I used to photoshop the uh, not, photocopy the pages out of the sex scenes out of romance novels at the library you know, so I could take them home. We just have the photocopies. And I remember my mom finding my stash of just photocopied sex scenes. And like, I can't express to you like the, the terror, like, like when, when I saw them in her hand, like my entire being, my soul jumped out of my body and crawled away. How old were you? Oh God, I must have been like 15 or so. <laughs> yeah. Maybe four, like 14 or 15. <laughs> so like anything like that, I'm like, oh my God, I can just just imagine like the feeling of like, you know, it's like. <laughs> yeah, this is my mom. But but I will tell you, you needed to find a better hiding place. What are you doing? No, <laughs> her I got better. Dude, her mom no, no. like searched her room. Her mom. My mom. Her yeah, mom like was a, the definition okay. of extra, like searching through her things. Her oh, yeah. hiding spaces were so complicated. Was, my my parents, on the other hand, just left. I mean, our whole house was covered in books always. Every room has bookshelves constantly. Yeah. Like, like my husband's always like, do we need another bookshelf? And I'm like, what am I supposed to do with all my stuff? <laughs> I 
got to put it somewhere. <laughs> and uh, the they would just have, I mean, romance. I mean, every, every kind of novel was just, I remember I read an Anne Rice one based in New Orleans. I forget the name Ooh. of it, but uh, there's a ghost in it. And I remember the ghost has sex with the woman. And I remember like, I must've been 13 or maybe 14. And I remember just like being in my room, like my cheeks were so hot from the blush. And I was just, <laughs> <laughs> my parents were like, what are you reading? I was like, this book's. And they're like, okay. I mean, like, you know, if you want to talk about it, let us know. But I just remember like the hot blush, but let's talk. Oh, let's yeah, talk oh my gosh. Let's talk about sex. I, I want to, sex is, sex is, you know, romance novels with no sex. It's really just a novel. It's just fiction. It's got to have a little steam, at least a little steam, you know? So what what do you feel like about, you know, sex in your books? How much is too much? How do you decide, you know, do you ever like write something and you're like, oh, that might be too much for this type of book or this character? Do you ever think like you're reading through a draft and you're like, wait a minute, like we need to have a few more like maybe like lusty encounters. What do you so, so with uh, when Bo and and you guys have read the books, so the Austin one, so Pride, Prejudice, and Other Flavors, and Persuasion both have um, you know what we call Fate to Black or Closed Door. I'm so sorry, That's okay. <laughs> both of you personally, but but of course um, there's a reason for that. So here's my my thing with um, you know with sex in my books is. You know what all authors say is that it has to be part of the story and it has to you know be be crucial to the story i was really i think with my first four books the first scenes one of the first scenes because i write out of order i write you know i write high emotion scenes as they come to me because i'll be writing something and then this like really high emotion scene will come to me and i will write it down you know at least sketch it down and uh, and all four of those books, the sex scenes were one of the first scenes I wrote because that's what we were moving toward right from the beginning, right? And so they are, I think, the heart of the books. Um, they are, um, I mean, absolutely pivotal, not even, you know, just um, a turning point, but absolutely pivotal scenes in all four of those books. I mean, there is the, the you know, in in a distant heart, there's a scene where it starts with "I don't want to die a virgin," Rahul. Like you know, so she's trying to get her best friend to sleep with her because she's going to have a heart transplant, and you know, and she doesn't want to die a virgin. And it's literally like that is, and so so the entire book we're working toward that point, right? And and they're still pretending to be friends and nothing more than that. And so they're they're. Um, they're pivotal scenes in each one of them in, in a Bollywood affair. She is, she considers herself married to another man and, um, and, and she only sleeps with him after she realizes that she has basically lived a lie because her husband is married to someone else. And that's a whole like coming into her and owning her sexuality scene, which is also, I think something for me, that's a little bit different maybe from somebody who's grown up, you know, not in the Indian culture is this whole um, idea that all of my heroines have, and not not the Indian American heroines, so not in um, Recipe for Persuasion or um, Pride, Prejudice, and Other Flavors, but in the first four books, these are women who have reasons to have lost the connection with their own sexuality, where they don't own themselves. And one of the ways that they don't own themselves is they don't own their own bodies and their own sexuality. And so those scenes are very, very pivotal in them claiming themselves. And so, um, so in fact, in, in Bollywood Affair, I remember my editor saying, you know, because for, for some reason, um, that was my first book. Nobody had any idea where to put it on the shelf. So they were trying of trying to sell it as a mainstream book, you know, and so there, it was this whole, we don't, you know, nobody really knew how to sell it. Um, it wasn't a time of rom-coms, you know, and diverse rom-coms like now it was completely a different time. And, and so he, he's, you know, he said, since it's, it's going to be mainstream, we can cut a, a 10 page love scene down to two. And I, I remember saying, absolutely not. Like, this is when the book turns and this is going to stay this long, if not longer. And, and of course, you know, in, in revision, I made that. And so, so his, his feedback had more to do with 
with the build up you know with building the build up more and so he was completely okay with it but i but but i think that's what it is to me so um so no i've i've the only time i've been told to cut it down i have uh not even given it a thought but uh, but they are they're incredibly um important and in in these books but again like in pride pride prejudice and other flavors when they finally get to that point the story is already over for the reader you already have gotten to the point as a reader where you need to be you know in their shoes and so all you really need is the satisfaction of seeing them together um and knowing that you know what the so so i do go into it enough to know to give you a hint of what the texture of their love making is going to be like right and with dj and trisha there's that playfulness and you know because she's a she's a clown and you know and so there's that whole um kind of you know friendly um they, and they again trisha is very comfortable with her own with herself right from the beginning of the book i mean there are things about her her herself and what she's done that she needs to in fact she's too comfortable with herself she needs to come down to a place where she's empathetic towards others that's her journey you know and so for her it's you know so f- you don't have to see her go through finding her body and her sexuality in that scene so she's just having fun you know and they're both having fun and you do get to see that so then there's really no reason for more than that and and um and in recipe for persuasion too it's not the first time you know there by the time they get to that point you're already at okay we get this like we got this what's happening with the rest of it so let's move on so again it's a pacing issue right at that point where I, holding the camera in that place would have been gratuitous if i had put sex in to these books yeah i think like an epilogue at the very end like a lot of people do <laughs> where they're like let's just have them in bed and wrap it all up would have felt very odd <laughs> this is venomous for sure yes so we're also quite curious uh where like where you write like how you write are you alone are you at a cafe do you need people are you like a hive mind type of person like how does it go down again i'm you know i'm i'm i wish i had answers to these questions because i'm i'm whatever it whatever i need at that time right and and um you know it's it's not simple <laughs> it's all i'll say so so i do when i'm in the zone i can write in the middle of a, you know a storm in the middle of a party you can put me anywhere and i don't care i can completely block everything out when my kids were little i wrote you know wrote on bleachers when they're you know in the middle of wrestling competitions and in the middle of uh you know swim meets um i wrote you know wrapped up in a blanket on a soccer and football field so i could write anywhere when i'm in the zone when i'm not in the zone you know when i'm struggling when i'm doing that whole oh my gosh i'm never writing another book again when i'm in that you know i've forgotten how to write a book and every single book i forget completely forget how to, and and i was there like i think a week ago where i was like i seriously don't fucking remember how this is done like i have no idea what i'm going to do and so when i'm in that phase or in that stage you can put me you know in a and 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 this uh you know these past 3 months have proven completely beyond a doubt that isolation and solitude don't equal productivity at all and so you can put me in this you know this completely quiet all my stuff here desk and and i'll still be like okay what's on the internet what's going on you know what's happening on twitter and who said what and pick up my phone and say oh gosh what happened how are you doing and so you know clean my house cook all the food you know bake and i'm not even a baker so all of that starts to happen so it's very internal and i've also you know found that there's just a cycle to it it's almost like you know your you know your hormonal menstrual cycle there's a cycle to it you start a book you have you know you feel like you completely got it you sit down with it you got nothing then you push and push and cry and sob and then you know you got something then you got nothing and then suddenly it starts to flow it doesn't so there's this whole like crazed process and and i think my physical surroundings um make not a difference to it like at all that there are times when i'll be you know i just i'm i'm doing good 
I want to go sit in a coffee shop, you know, just because I just maybe it'll spark, you know. So so that kind of stuff I'll do. I write in the library, I'll kind of, you know, write here and there. But in all honesty, it's really what's going on inside the head that that kind you know dictates what's happening on the paper more than where I am. That makes complete sense because there is so I, I've been working from home for years now and and Shani works from home or is working like on set or in the music studio or, or whatever so it's it, it, you can be at home and have the perfect quote unquote working environment and get nothing done. I'll do the same thing. I'll clean my house. I got babies. So I'll, I'll just play with the baby for a little bit. Oh, I'll just go cook some food. I'll just clean up all the food. I just go, I'll just like plant some stuff in my yard. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I did literally zero things for myself today. You're, you're, um, like, you're like, it's 10 o'clock at night. Like how did, <laughs> how did this happen? <laughs> I mean, it's July. No, it's June. I'm I know. Sorry. See, in my July, it's June. That's half a year gone. I'm, I don't. It. You know. I mean, this was New Year's Eve yesterday. Yeah. So. Yeah, Shawnee left. <laughs> we last saw each other. I think on like February 29th or March 1st or something. And yeah. my kid was five months old, and now she's eight and a half months old. And. Shawnee saw her the other day on video and was like, oh my God, my baby. She's getting so big. It's my baby. It's my best friend. Because for the first five months of Molly's life, she was here three times a week, cuddling her and like playing with her. And now, so like time has really, even though quarantine feels like we've been in quarantine forever, like it, it has been a long time. I mean, it's been months of being, you know, essentially at home away from people. Yeah. So can you, okay. First. On the baby. Oh, what would you say? I didn't hear you because it was. Said, congratulations! <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. She's very cute. She could crawl. Her name is Molly, and I have a two and a half year old named Kira, and uh, they are just peaches. Molly's like the chillest baby of all time. Like I schedule these interviews knowing for sure that she will be asleep between one and three without fail. Like. As long as her morning nap, like she is just, she's a peach. She's a peach. I, I love like, that. I like her. I love that. Mine were okay. easy too. And I didn't tell people that because people hate you. I you know, know. My daughter slept through the night in the hospital. And I, I told the doctor, should I wake her up? Like, is something wrong with her? Like, is my baby going to live? And he's like, woman, you know, people would pay like a million dollars to have a baby <laughs> in the hospital first night. She slept yeah. through the night. Yeah, my kids. And he was like, don't tell people, they might kill you. <laughs> my, I try not to talk to people about my kids' sleep schedule unless they ask for advice because both of them have slept more than 10 hours a night since they were like, I don't know, yeah. 10, 10 weeks probably. And by yeah. six weeks, they were both sleeping like seven hour, eight hour stretches. Like they're just good. We worked on our schedule. We worked on our, I mean, we did our diligence and. They like yeah. sleeping. Molly's yeah. Molly's big problem right now is she wakes up at 5 30 because she has to poop because she's eating so much food. That's our big I'm like, wait till 6 30. Let's get another hour of sleep. But <laughs> <laughs> does she go back to sleep if after she poops? No, we just eat and stay up and then she takes her morning nap at like you know, 8 38 ish. So yeah, so it's good. It all it all works out. She's a peach. I have I have a question on behalf of Shawnee because Shawnee exclusively listens to audiobooks does not read a book anymore physically we read one so far in our tenure of the show and we have decided we're never doing it again and we'll only do books that have audiobooks because honestly because her the big difference was her review changed we were talking about this we said if if there had been an audiobook i think she would have reviewed it more favorably because she's just used to that medium Versus she's just not used to reading. Whereas I only exclusive, I never listen to audiobooks. But how do you, do you get a say in the narrator? Do you get to choose them? Do you get to kind of QC the way? Because like, especially for your books, because they have so many different names that need to be pronounced correctly. How do you, do you get to be involved in that? Yes. So um, I think my first couple books, um, you know, they, I was just like, wow, if there's audio, right? You know, I mean, with your first books, you're like, wow, there's a cover. Wow. You know, like every <laughs> great gift that you are not worthy of. <laughs> and it's all just gratefulness as it should be, because it's so 
joyous. But uh, but yes, uh, with these books, I have, you know, I'm sent clips, I get to pick. Um, and then one of the things I do is um, I, I, I record myself saying the names, uh, the and, and both, the only two narrators I've had are, were both American, uh, Indian American. Mm. And so, you know, it wasn't like words were that foreign, but, um, you know, even so, I, you know, I mean, it's um, both of them were not from Maharashtra, which is, you know, the part of India I'm from. And so there are words because I have Marathi words in there. And so I'll pronounce them. So I, I do record the words for them um, and, and um, you know, and send them over. There are, I didn't get to do that with my first one. And there's still stuff in there that I'll be like, oh, you know, a little bit of a cringe. And I think one of the big things, and I think Priya Iyer is an amazing narrator. Like she really has a gorgeous voice and she did uh, Bollywood Affair and Bollywood Bride. Um, but in the first book in Bollywood Affair, you know, the nuance, because they're both from India, they're Indian characters, they're not Indian American characters, they just are here for a short period of time. So it's set here in Michigan, but it is, um, you know, they're both Indian characters. And he is, um, you know, he's anglicized urban and she's, you know, from a village. Um, and, and so if you had to do the accents, like the two separate Indian accents, you would do them like that, but they're flipped over. And so her accent is very, you know, is, is almost, you know, is, is the more urban anglicized and, and he sounds a little more Indian in some of the scenes. So, you know, things like that can happen. Um, but, but now I, as far as I could not even have predicted that to say, be careful about that. Not that, you know, at that point I just got the audio book, but now I do, you know, words. Um, and I will say that this one, so, so from that, that time on, I started to say Rhea is from Bombay. So she has an urban Indian accent and Vikram of course is in, you know, is from California. So he has, a, you know, a, a, a Californian, um, you know, accent. And so, um, so I, yes. I get, um, and, and it's really wonderful, I think, how publishers are, you know, being um, being so um, overtly conscious of these things now, or at least I'm lucky enough to have an editor and publishers who are doing that. Yeah, have you, so humor me on this, because nobody else I talk to knows anything about Bollywood, so I'm very excited about this. Um, <laughs> Uh, do you pull from from your like favorite Bollywood movies? What is your favorite Bollywood movie? And who's your favorite ho your favorite Bollywood power couple? Oh my gosh! I mean, you I know you want me to say Ranveer and Deepika. I know you want me to say Ranveer and Deepika. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think they are currently the most gorgeous, uh, you know, Indian couple, and um, and they just feel so. You know, of course actors what we see of them and what you know what's really going on in their lives we don't know but 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 based on the image um you know imagery that we see i i there's something so delightful about you know ranveer singh and deepika together because i follow them both on instagram and one of the most delightful things is their comments on each other's posts. It is just freaking adorable because they'll say these like very, um, you know, very funny, very what real, like what a real couple would say to each other. Like they make fun of some, you know, even, even if it's this completely posed model shot to just someone hanging out in the house. And so just the things they say to each other are so adorable. So I do love them so much. Um, there are other couples that I feel are just like, you know, oh, come on. Like, really? You know, you can't possibly be like, oh, he's the best guy on earth, like all the time. <laughs> the marketing exercise. And, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a flimsy, very transparent marketing exercise. So stop it. Yeah. You know, so, <laughs> so, so they are, they are able to, I think, not not do that like their relationship feels very very real and something uh very relatable 
to me. But of course, they're from Bombay. They're very much the kind of, you know, little social bubble that I'm, you know, I've grown up and I'm, I'm used to. So I very much relate to how they relate to each other. But but influences. Um, so So, of course, I'm influenced, you know, I think stylistically so much by, I mean, that whole high stakes, heightened drama thing. Uh, that is very much sty stylistically part of my work is very Bollywood. Like it's a very specific storytelling style, and and newer Bollywood is is grittier and more re you know real. Not all you know, the seventies and eighties Bollywood was just over the top to a point where you didn't even like you had to. The what we used to say about it is that you had to actually put your you know set your brain aside and watch which always kind of annoyed me. I'm like, why do you have to set your brain aside and watch a film, right? A film should be a story where I get to keep my brain. Thank you very much. And so I think that, that you know, pre seven like 70s, uh, you know, when people like, when Rishikesh Mukherjee was making his films, that was that. It was, of course, it was larger than life stories sometimes, but it was very common, common man. And it was very real. You know, it was all very... Um, you could put yourself in those shoes and then 80s and 90s just was like what is going on and um it was this whole explosion of craziness all the time and you had to set your brain aside and i think the newer um films again have started paying some heat to realism while still keeping that you know that heightened emotionality so if you're watching gully boy or you know dil dhadakne do they're still very much in the bollywood style but you don't have to put your brain aside. You're thinking. They're still making you. And I think that's my, um, you know, that's it. I, I, I want it to be very entertaining. But I do want you very much to be in possession of your brain and using it and kind of hopefully prodding it to grow in some way, you know, which is so, so, so certainly, um, you know, my, my Bollywood influences, I think, from um, some of it is from the 70s and some of it is. The, the newer Bollywood, um, but there is that um, that larger than life feeling of you know. The, I mean, you want you want the songs to be bursting in your head, right? You want the violins to be playing when a you know when a sad thing is happening in your head, and so in those ways, very much, um, very much an influence in a recipe for persuasion. If you remember, there's actually. Um, you know, references to, uh, again, with Shobi, because I was, you know, so, because she is so my angry feminine scream, feminist scream. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, there's there's the reference to that scene from Kabhi Kabhi, right? Where, um, you know, which was such a part of, while growing up, the stories we were watching, right? The stories that we were watching in... Um, so, 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 so... <laughs> I, I have not finished recipe for persuasion. I'm almost there, right? But Kabi oh, no. Kabi, so so whenever I am so sad, I put on that Kabi Kabi Mera Dil Me. I I don't know why, but it it just like when I, that's my jam. I I I have to say I listen to that probably once every three months at least. I'm like, where is my song? I need it. I need it. I, that's so, something so that I listen. I listen to it every. I think once a day, some, maybe. So it's like it's the softest, sweetest. Like it puts me in in such a mood when I listen to that song. It's amazing. So now that I know, so I haven't actually got there. So now I know it's coming. <laughs> have excited. you have you watched the movie though? Have you watched Kabi Kabi? Yeah, many times. Yeah. So so it is in my opinion. Again, you were asking for a favorite. It's certainly like up there you know, top five for sure. It is, I think, uh, it was made in 1973, 74, thereabouts. Yeah. And uh, so ahead of its time. The things that it gets into are so ahead of its time. And um, and and just the complexity of storytelling and everything is very much, uh, you know, a cut above what else was being made, I think, at the time. And it has, and so it has, um, you know, it has aged well. You can still watch it. And it's not, you know, it's not some of the movies that I remember loving as a child are crazy, crazy pants now. It's like, what? <laughs> you know? And so this one has is there's a lot of very sensitive and sensible stuff in there. But still there is, um, you know, growing up, one of the things that was in all all of these, you know, or, or in several Bollywood films was the whole concept of, um, you know, of of 
the the arranged marriage trope bollywood style was very much if you're forced into a marriage with somebody because of the sanctity of marriage if you put your head down and you accept that and you make a compromise then then essentially you find happiness and and possibly more happiness than you would have found had you gone after what you really wanted and i always thought that was a horrible horrible um message to be sending out to women right and it used to make me very very angry and 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 kabhi kabhi the song is um is filmed on her marriage bed when lit- and and she's married married off to someone else when she was in love with this poet and her husband whom she doesn't know makes her on their wedding night sing this poem that her lover wrote for her like it was so a uh, violating to me like i used to and everybody and it is it's such a gorgeous song he is a great guy it all works out for them you know because she throws herself into this new relationship knowing she has no choice so she makes her life and everybody's life around her better and all of that but it's still a terrible message for me growing up because i'm like no but she was in love with the other guy she wanted him you know and and um and and you're telling me that she's happy because she and of course she's happy because she put her down, head down and you know made a compromise but don't tell me that in storytelling right that's wrong that tells me the wrong thing and so i wanted like to head on address that and and you know in recipe she head on addresses that because she's in that exact same situation and she's like excuse me not you know not a fucking chance that i'm doing this that i'm putting <laughs> I'm okay with this and and so that it was a, it was very directly addressing something that bothered me growing up um and and in the film they do address it like her husband you know years later when they've had this long happy marriage he says it he says that you know not for a moment in your life did you not give me everything you you were and you know it's the greatest gift you not even for a minute did i ask if you know you were unhappy with anything or uh, and and maybe i should have and it's amazing how women can do that and you know yeah oh well women can do that because they don't have a fucking choice you know and so 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 it is so there is you know some direct um you know directly addressed issues from the bollywood of my childhood every once in a while i think that's really um really powerful really interesting i i mean i grew up watching these and i i remember watching um hamdil de chuke sanam hamdil de chuke sanam is the other one thank yes. you yes which you know in which you know uh, she's in love with the the musician mm-hmm. the artist and then she gets I'm the arranged going- marriage <laughs> I I am going to speak over you because I was that movie made me so angry so so angry I I mean you know I mean they have you set up you set us up you set me up watching this thing with this beautiful love because Salman and Aishwarya literally have this gorgeous relationship right you make me fall in love with them and then boom she's supposed to like fall in love with this you know whoever you know joshmo schmuck off the street well he's not joshmo off the street but you know what i mean to her he is like who are you what are you doing in my life and just because daddy dearest decides that's the right guy and that was such an issue for me and for those who don't know about this film she's in love with someone her dad throws a fit and forces her into a marriage with someone else and then this someone else is quote unquote such a great guy well you know i'm being a little facetious and angry but he's a great guy and he says well if you're not in love with me then i swore to make you happy and so i'm going to take you to find whoever this guy that you were separated from is and he takes her and this guy is from italy and so you know he takes her on a trip across europe looking for her ex lover and it should have been like all fine great you know you're a great guy that's great there is my lover and it was very nice meeting you instead in that process because this guy loves her so much and because there is the sanctity of marriage she ends up falling in love with her husband and it was preposterous <laughs> i was like what so i was very very angry <laughs> with that movie too i feel and, like that did you watch i was going to say did you watch 
go on. I was gonna say, I feel like that's the difference between uh, American movies and because in American movies, the parent tries to force the person to marry who they don't want to, and they like run away, and never speak to the family again. And that's like the story of the movie is them either not speaking to their family again, or years later, the family like finally accepting them because they had kids or or someone's dying or whatever. But like, I feel like the American that's, like, that's nice. you, you just described. You no. just described Cubby Cushy Cubby Gum. Cubby Gum. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a lot of Hindi movies too. Have you watched yes. Man Man Mia? No, no, I haven't. So that is that that's very much Hamdil De Chuke Sanam, but but it's the focus is on female agency. So it really does is not about her parents saying no. It's not about any of that. It's about this guy being, you know being a putz and kind of just not getting his act together and having cold feet and having, you know, commitment issues. Oh. So he's in love with her, but he can never, you know, he kind of, when she needs him to come up to scratch, so to speak, he can't and all of this. So it's very much between them. And she says, you know what, screw you. I'm going to marry the next guy who comes along. And then the next guy who comes along is a really nice guy. And so she gets caught in this situation where she is like, okay, I'm in love with this other guy, but this guy is great too. And so it's very much her journey, which is fine. It's not someone telling her, you know, X or Y. Of course, Manmarzi, I think, loses the plot a little bit because they didn't quite know what to do with it then because here she is and there are these two great guys and, you know, it's now her decision. So what does she choose? And so it goes all over the place after that. But that's an okay discussion to have. But to say, oh, you know, because a lot of Indian culture in terms of storytelling is acceptance, you know, the, the whole God give me strength to accept the things I cannot change, you know. And and uh, and I think that maybe it's time to tell stories where you're, where you're saying, you know, help me change the things I cannot accept. You know, we have to kind of change that lens a little bit. So, yes. So that actually kind of leads me into something. So um, in Hamdal De Chuke Salam, there was, this was the first time I encountered colorism in a, in a Bollywood movie where they actually like came out and said it. Right. So she was in love with the artist, but the guy that she was engaged to be married to um, had darker skin. And so one of the she she doesn't want to marry if she's talking about that. And somebody says to her, oh, you don't want to marry him because he's dark skin. And I I very much remember that line. Um, And so it just kind of segues me into uh, the question, which is like um, when you think when you're thinking about writing your books and the characters that are going to be in them. Um, what do you think of in terms of um, inclusion and having people of do- other ethnic- ethnicities in those stories? And then what would you do or do you do to prepare um, to tell those stories um, with the most accuracy and with the most, um, you know, like, yeah, accuracy, basically, okay. <laughs> as, as possible? <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's a great question because... You know, there's two sides to that. And one is that I'm very much interested in um, telling a certain kind of Indian story um, in terms of it never being poverty porn or, you know, it never being, uh, never um, working its, you know, way into Western, you know, fantasies of exotic exoticism and you know things like that so it's it's very much I mean there is culture in it but it's it's there because that happens to be who the characters are and the stories are always about the conflict and about the character arc the stories are not about um the culture and um and and so again that is a little bit of a hard sell because um because often our stories are seen as you know, as, oh, let me, you know, let me take a walk in the shoes of this Indian person. And then when you've read one, you're like, oh, I've read one of those. So I know now, I mean, there have literally been readers who I have heard say, oh, I've read one of those. I know what it's like in an Indian family. And, you know, I'm making big eyes here, which you cannot see on the podcast, but it's like, um, really? 
and and also you know so so there are these preset notions that an indian story has to an indian american story has to be about immigrant angst you know that uh, an indian american story has to be about someone or any immigrant story has to be about running away because your home has become too painful are those real stories yes are those important stories yes is that the only story no a lot of immigrants come here for the same reasons immigrants years and years ago came for for you know for adventure for meeting their you know highest potential because something interesting and exciting outside of what they knew called to them because you know either we are nomads or we are trees like i always say this about my brother and me that that you know he's a tree you know his roots he would you cannot imagine him outside of where he, he where he grew up and he lives and and for me i always feel like an outsider wherever i am i just have that mindset of you know a traveler it's it's um it's it's i want to constantly grow i want to see more you know so 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 a lot of immigrants come here for that independence and adventure and all of those things which is one of the reasons i think this you know we make we make this country great is because we bring that innovation and excitement with us right and so where are those stories right it's not you're not always fleeing persecution you might be fleeing a, a life laid out too straight for you right and and you might be um, you might be fleeing things you've not even recognized in your youth that that you knew something more there was something more you know that that there is something more inside you and you couldn't even name it so there's many re- you know so so i want to tell indian stories that feel authentic to me and and these are the journeys that feel authentic to me but i want the stories to be about what's going on in these characters lives you know and and their journeys to becoming a better person to healing wounds and things like that not about waking up in the morning looking in the mirror and thinking oh my gosh i'm a brown person and i don't fit in america right <laughs> i mean i don't i really don't think no anyone who actually does that and yet in books that's what we're told you know people are doing so so that's the you know that's the indian um aspect of it and i also specifically i think um wanted this set of books because these um the austin books the rajay family is is very overtly um you know i'm with those books i'm overtly exploring assimilation right versus um you know i'm i'm overtly talking about making home the act of making home and um and and so you're not alone in that right you're a 1% minority making home in a place which is a home to a lot of people who don't look and act like you so that assimilation is about you wanting to be accepted and and again this happens in immigrant communities while you're very indignant about being accepted for who you are you you may not show that same courtesy to those who aren't like you and so which i think again all bubbles do and it is certainly something we should be talking about and so there's a lot of that in these books when i and, and so dj again uh, you know is is a black british character who is half rwandan half um anglo indian and and um again what what i was actively looking at in that book was what do people see when they see you right so when you see me so often um you know people see an indian woman of a certain age and that comes with this whole story they've already made up about me in their head based on you know either books they've read or other indian people they've met or whatever right and and this happens to all of us and so with dj i was and with trisha right because how trisha feels um is 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 you know when people see her and he sees her and says like she doesn't even realize she's in the, you know she's she's not a white woman sometimes and that may be true but again it's not he's judging her and so there's a lot of that i was trying to kind of play with and and dj when somebody meets him for the first time they they are bringing whatever they project onto an african american person or an african american man that they see and 
he is not. He is Black, British, Anglo-Indian, right? And so again, a whole different history, a whole different, you know, identity. And he's not allowed to have it because boom, you are what I see you to be. And um, and and how does that work, you know, for a person? And how do we learn to navigate that? Um, you know, and and I see that in my own life, right? Sometimes I'm overtly trying. And for for many years, I was overtly trying to translate myself all the time, all the time. I was like, oh look, I'm just like you. Oh look, I'm just like you. And um, and at one point, you grow up enough to think. I don't know if that's my job, right? To to translate myself for you all the time. It is your job to meet me at least halfway. And and so that growth I think is something again I explore in my characters. And and as far as writing um you know writing DJ again the whole Anglo-Indian culture comes with you know it's it's this very um uh, it's this interesting cultural phenomenon because 200 years we were colonized by the british and so you had a large subculture of you know of the progeny that came from that intermingling and um and and in some ways they didn't belong you know they didn't feel like they belonged to the indian culture and then the british culture didn't feel like they belonged entirely to them and so there was this whole and and colonization comes with you know laddering a cultural laddering and all of that and so so there is this fa- and talk about colorism right there is this family who returns to england and uh and is trying to wash literally trying to wash the brown out of their uh, out of their bloodline and um and and so you know their son who is this hazel eyed you know completely white looking man in their view uh they they do believe they have now washed the brown out of their <laughs> bloodline and then he falls in love with a rwandan refugee and so it's you know and and this to me is you know is is just delicious <laughs> it's just like you know you guys are you you're idiots right you're fucking idiots because love doesn't have anything to do with any of this and uh and you know and beauty has nothing to do with it and so so little ways in which you play with all of that then again dj and uh, emma handle their own you know their own color and their own racial genetic material they've gotten from both their parents in completely different ways and they and they process it differently and so there's um you know of course these are just these single characters and not speaking for entire cultures but but i'm really really um fascinated by digging into those things and um and as far as authenticity oh gosh so so rico is um rico is uh, is born and raised in rio de janeiro he's brazilian again british mother and he's um you know his father is from brazil and um and and we visited rio about 3 4 years ago and that was purely me just falling in love with that place and I mean I was in Rio de Janeiro and I knew I was going to write um a, I was going to write a character who was from there because it's such a spirit city as someone who's grown up in 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 Mumbai for me you know you can never ever take Mumbai or Bombay out of me like that's just such a part of my identity and who I am and and Rio just is that kind of city and so I knew I was going to write you know a person who was born and raised there so there's uh, there's a lot of that but but of course i can there's no way i can get around the fact that i can write with utmost authenticity an indian character and when i write a character of a different culture i have to have the humility for when i have to do all of the you know as i study as much as i can i always try to write um you know if i'm going to write a major character who is not my culture i at least will try and write someone that i have friends in that culture and not like i just made friends with you to write this character but someone i have you know friends i have had for 10 and 20 years and um be- because then at least you have some you know shared um shared life story 
And of course, you do all the research and everything, but you still have to be willing to accept that, you know, you 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 don't have the generational memory, and you know, you don't have the gen, you know, the the handed down um, experience or the 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 baby, you know, I mean, our experience from the time that we are toddlers to the world is within our culture and so of course somebody who's writing you know when when someone writes in their own culture there is more authenticity to it and um which which doesn't doesn't mean that with you know with humility and with curiosity and wonder that that you try to so so it's and the other thing is i'm not trying to write about what it's like to be a black man I'm trying to write about what it is like to be DJ Kane. And, you know, and, and that's the only thing I can do authentically because I, you know, because DJ Kane has come from my heart and my mind and I can tell the story of DJ Kane and, and Rico Silva, same way. Sonali, this has been just such a pleasure. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, Tell our dear friends where they can find you. What's the best way to connect with you? And aside from buying all of your books, which we definitely recommend how they can support you as an author. For buying all my books. <laughs> I, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. Um, all of those links are on sonalibave.com. Um, I have a newsletter in which I send out, you know, which I barely send out. It's my... Uh, probably one a month and I do something called the three R's which are you know a recipe a recommendation and a really bad joke that my family sends me on group chat because why should I suffer alone um and um and and currently you can buy signed books from uh women and children first which is a Chicago uh, independent bookstore Anderson's bookshop which is also a Chicago area bookstore and um, Love Sweet Arrow. So there are three fabulous indies that all have signed copies of Recipe for Persuasion and a lot of my other books as well. So please support the indies. Um, and of course, uh, if you can buy the book, buy the book. And if you can't, because these are tough times, um, your libraries should have all of them. And it, it's always really helpful to put the book on hold at your library if it, and, and request it if they don't have it, because that really helps too. And it's your taxpayer dollars. So yeah, support libraries, indie bookstores, and me. <laughs> all right. Well, we will have all this the links, amazing. links to those signed uh, copies at the independent bookstores in the Chicagoland area. And also links to connect with Sonali. Thank you so much again for being here. This was great. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to our channel to get new episodes, clips, and more. And click here to watch our previous reviews and author interviews.